Welcome to another episode of Jamming with Jason. Hey, uh, today is going to be a very special episode. Why? Because today it's Jason Squared Day. You didn't even know that, right? So yeah, we got two Jasons on the podcast today. Jason Cutter is joining me today. And I got to tell you, this is going to be one of those discussions where we're probably going to be all over the board. You know, maybe talking about whales and marine biology and sales, and you're thinking, what the hell are you guys talking about? But don't worry, don't worry, like all the episodes, right? Just hang in here and listen, because whatever you do, listen to this whole episode, because the fact that you're listening right now means there's at least one thing you need to hear in today's episode. So with that, let's just get right into the episode with Jason. Hey, Jason, how you doing, man? (laughs) <laughs> I, I i i am super excited uh a another jason uh as a host so two jasons combined and whatever that could do to the universe and fact of time and reality um and, and then also just literally that we chatted for a while and that could have also been the podcast and we haven't even oh. gotten started yet and who knows where this is going to go and that's my favorite mode i i've been on some shows where people try to hand me a script and i'm just like no. that's terrible i i don't i don't want to do that uh let's let's just see what happens and i love your intro which is because somebody's listening to this there's something in here they're supposed to get which is what i believe like whenever i hear something it's like okay what is the thing i was supposed to get so let's see see what we throw out there let's see where we go well and i gotta you know again it's there's no script on this because i'm not a robot you know sort of thing (laughs) but i just gotta ask you too because i think you're the first jason that i've had on here too so i don't know if it was if it was like you growing up too i know We'll, we'll talk a little bit about us growing <laughs> up because I think like like we were talking in the green room, you and I had some similar experiences being the picked on kid and some of the other stuff that we'll probably yeah. get to. But but did you have the issue too where it's like Jason was just like this popular Ever. name and everybody had it, right? I mean, I remember in second grade, I was so mad. In second grade, I had to write my full name on all of my yeah assignments because there was another Jason with the last name that started with M. So I couldn't even be Jason M. Right. I was like, so glad when that kid left so I could just be Jason (laughs) M. But I'm guessing you were the same way too, right? You were just like surrounded Uh, by Jason's everywhere. hundred percent. Something about kids born in the middle of the seventies. I was born in 75. So then, you know, growing up in a kid of the early eighties, I can remember at one, I, I had to write my full name and Jason wasn't enough. Jason C wasn't enough. I think it was my third or fourth birthday party. There was three Jason C's, a John C, uh, and a non-Jason C at the party. Like literally from about the fourth grade on, everyone just called me Cutter. In fact, if I talked to any of my high school friends from then, they still at this age still just say just Cutter, call Cutter because yeah. that's all they know me as because they're not a unique snowflake with that name. Well, it's funny because I was I was born a little before before, but it was, you know, I was actually no name baby Mefford, right? Like I went home and it was like a week or two before my my parents and finally the hospital called him and they're like, What are you gonna call this kid? And my dad's yeah. like, I don't know, how about Jason? They'd never heard of it, they never knew anybody with that what? name. And then yeah, it's like boom, 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 right? Like everybody's yeah, everybody. calling their kids Jason and now nothing. So anyway. Maybe it's all you you started the trend in the universe. Oh it all just dominoed I, from you. I, I I doubt it, but man, <laughs> well, you know, whatever, right? <laughs> I doubt I doubt it. I'm not that special. I'm special, but I'm not that special. All right. <laughs> well, anyway, so all right. Again, no script. We're just having fun here too, right? But but I, I wanted to, you know, because I know. Uh, I, I, wanna, I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of your origin story, because as we were talking about before, I think, you know, this is one thing that I love doing is helping show other people what other people's lives are like and, and the, yeah. the journeys they've come through, because, you know, sometimes people just need a little extra hope and encouragement and realize that they're not the only one who feels like this or who has gone through some of these same things. So, so, so let's, let's kind of talk about that because I know, you know, now you do help people kind of from a sales perspective and we'll talk a little bit about that, but, but you got there in a very different way, right? So how, you know, kind of from, from the, from the kid to, to, to kind of going through to getting where you are now, how did that happen? Right. Cause it, it, it's not a traditional route. 
Uh, it is not a traditional route. If there was a traditional route for people who end up in sales, right? Sales books, do sales coaching and consulting, have podcasts for that kind of person. It's funny because I talk to people like that all the time. And, and the people who did go the traditional route, like they've been selling since they were six years old. And it's like, okay, that made a lot of sense. Uh, for me, I was the product of two loving young parents. They're still together to this day, uh, still married. Um, and uh, my mom went into banking and then moved her way up in organizations, finance. My dad was an engineer after the Navy and then went, moved his way up and around in his organization he was at. And so the product of two analytical parents and uh, I was a shy, awkward, late blooming uh, child. I am an only child. So I didn't really have anyone else to socialize. Uh, we all didn't fit in, in the neighborhood when we, we moved there when I was like five and, uh, yeah, I, I, one part of it that I don't talk a lot about on the podcast, just cause you know, it usually doesn't come up, but in the second grade, I actually took the test to determine that I should be in like the higher classes of education, not like skip a grade, but like in, in the advanced class. So what it meant was we were living in a blue collar neighborhood, but then I, tested into the rich kids who are driven, who bust down from the hill uh, to go to those classes. So I was in their class. So I didn't fit in with the rich kids because I was not a rich kid. And I, and the neighborhood kids didn't like me because they thought I was smarter and better than them. And so then began, began the not fitting in anywhere and being bullied by both groups um, from about the second grade on. And, um, and then you mix in with that, especially when we get to sales, is that my mom being in banking, being in finance, seeing all that stuff, and both of them being analytical, literally deeply hate salespeople, deeply hate the classic old school, manipulative, pushy, self-centered salesperson, right? Um, many times I have so many stories, one of which when I was, uh, I think it was somewhere around I think it was about 11. Uh, we ended up at a Toyota dealership for nine hours while my mom battled everybody <laughs> they could throw at her. Uh, we did buy the, the <laughs> two door Toyota forerunner that they wanted to buy. Um, but imagine this is the eighties, right? There's no internet. It's me. I mean, many hours of my childhood spent in lobbies that smell like tires and, and stale coffee while my parents are battling salespeople. That that's the impression that I got about people, about sales, about business. Well, and it's so interesting because again, it's, it's the, uh, you know, cause uh, let's go and talk about it. Cause I, I was in a lot of ways similar, right. I was kind of the, the weird kid. I had, I had some friends, but we didn't really fit in, you know, in, in, in a lot of the places either. Right. And so, you know, our, our younger years, a lot of times are so formidable for us, right. Because either, either they drive us well, they do drive us to be who we are. Yeah. They, they, they develop the character that we have. Sometimes we have to kind of reprogram some of those things as well, right? But, but, but also sometimes it, it really is that character building that kind of creates, you know, who we are. So, so again, I mean, how, how or what did you learn as that kid who was kind of stuck in the middle, right? The rich kids didn't didn't like you because you weren't rich and you didn't live by them. You lived in the blue collar area. So the kids didn't want to play with you because you're better than me, right? Because you're smarter than right. me. Yep. How, how did you kind of navigate through that? And how, how has that kind of actually helped you? Because I'm sure it has helped you as an adult now, you know, in, in yeah. kind of how you grew up that way and also kind of the way, the way that your family was, the way your parents were. Yeah. How I navigated. I don't know. I think I blocked most of it out and, and I didn't have a terrible childhood. Like it wasn't that rough. Like I wasn't being beat. Oh, you had loving just, parents too. I mean, it was I had like, loving parents yeah. and a, a good home, just social structure was not good, but not terrible. Right. Not the stuff of, of horror movies. Um, so navigating, it just kind of got through it. Just, just accepted it. It just was what it was by the time junior high and high school came around, it was, just I was in that group with my other strange friends and and playing video games where we everyone knew who I was. Um, not too cool to be invited to parties, but not so uncool. I needed to prove how uncool or cool I was. So it was just kind of just kind of floating through. Um, and and for me, some of the biggest things, and this is what I get from my parents as well, is just a deep seated empathy and desire to help the underdog. That is one of the fundamental tenements of like my own mission statement that drives me every day. 
um, is helping the underdog win their game, right? And what is an underdog? Well, that's somebody who doesn't think they should be the one or they don't have the thing or they're not the, the most likely to succeed, but can they? Uh, I feel like I've always been the underdog. I still feel like I'm the underdog. I come from a family of underdogs. Uh, funny story, growing up in the San Francisco Bay Area in the 80s, uh, I've always voted. I still always vote for the underdog. Uh, I lost a lot of money as a teenager betting against the 49ers every year because they were not the underdog. They were the favorite to win. Uh, and I, I looked bad and lost a lot of money because I literally would not ever side with the Niners. And it wasn't until late in my adult life where I finally accepted actually watching their games and supporting them because they're no longer the underdogs. They suck. Um, and so it's kind of that Gary V mode, right? Like Gary V, if anyone's familiar, talks about he wants to buy the Jets and he's a Jets fan until they probably win. And if they win, he's no longer going to be a Jets fan. He, he, he and I, our birthdays are very close to each other. Um, and so it's that underdog side and that empathy side that drives me because I know what it's like to not fit in. And we haven't even gotten to my degree or my career path. But we're going to get what there. It's like to yeah. lose a lot, to be lost, to be punched in the face, to have no idea what you're doing, to feel bad about it every day uh, of being on a windy path instead of the American dream. And so I am highly empathetic and always driven to help anybody who says, I don't know how to win. I don't think I can. Like, I'll give you everything I got. Well, and that's why, you know, we have a mutual friend, Brian Ahern, who's been on the podcast before. And that's why I can't remember if it was you or if it was Brian that reached out to me, but, but, you know, the combination of the two, like knowing, knowing, and then when I looked at some of the stuff you're doing, I'm like, yeah, Cutter's like, he's one, he's one of my guys, right? It's like, cause we are so much aligned on that about, you know, the empathy and the love and, and, and standing up for the underdog. Cause I've been there. I've been there a lot of my life, just like you have as well. Right. And it's like, things got to change. I mean, things, you know, there are some bullies on the, on the playground that need to have things change. And, but, but all of us that are the underdogs need to know there's others like us around. Right. Yeah. And, and realize, Hey, you know what, if you like playing video games, fine. Video games are awesome. Right. I played a lot of video games, you know, younger now I don't anymore, but you know, it's uh but but there were certain things dungeons and dragons you know some yep. other things that i that i used to do where i was yeah a little bit different than some of the other kids but that's all right so so yeah so okay so we we got a little bit of that so now now let's go to so again so here you are right kind of this awkward kid you know not not terrible stuff but you know you've got this this little bit of social awkwardness from your parents and especially what your parents, you know, what they do. And like you said, hanging out in a, in an auto dealership for nine hours is painful, <laughs> yep. right? Yeah. Uh, painful. Even, even when it's a smooth transaction, it's still like three hours. I, I remember the excitement when I turned, I think it was somewhere around 13, 14, when they actually would let me stay home alone. And I remember that first time I didn't go to the dealership and they came back five hours later with a car and I got to hang out with a friend instead of go for the first time. And I was like, this is glorious. Right. I still awesome. remember that day, like we're talking, I don't know, 30 years ago. And I still remember that day. Yeah. Well, so, so, so here you are, right. I mean, so you, yep. you, you, you graduate high school, you finally get through high school. What are you going to do for a living? Right. So, 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 cause I, cause I think that to me, this is a fascinating part of your journey too. Yeah. Right. So what, what'd you decide to do? Well, part of this was no one in my family close or extended family had ever gone to college, not on my mom's side, not on my dad's side, not cousins. Uh, I had an older cousin who was in community college, but nobody had gone to university college and got a degree. So there was uh, pressure and pushing towards that, which I was okay with. It wasn't like against my will, but I also didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, and uh, because I was interested in sharks and really loved marine biology, I went to UC Santa Cruz and got my degree in marine biology. And while I was there and for a few years after, I actually tagged sharks, uh, I've tagged lots of sharks from, you know, two foot, three foot sharks, catching them by hand in the, in, in the slough, you know, in the brackish water up to, you know, helping tag 18 foot great white sharks all in, you know, in California, in the Santa Cruz area. Um, and that was the path I wanted to go on. Uh, and then where life said, no, uh, thanks for playing. Uh, that sounds great, but no thanks. Um, 
after I graduated with years and hours of shark tagging experience, I, probably by that point, I'd caught, I don't know, three, 400 sharks by the time I, you know, got the degree. Um, I couldn't even get an $8 an hour job scrubbing boats for fish and game. Literally, they gave that to a master's student because remember, we're talking mid late 90s. Everyone wants to work at oh, SeaWorld. Yeah. Everyone wants to train dolphins. Everyone wants to be a marine biologist like Jacques Cousteau. And literally, it was so competitive $8 an hour scrubbing boats. They gave it to a master's student. And I was like, I, at the time, my thought was, I am burnt out. I can't go do more schooling. What I realized in retrospect is I was on the wrong path. It wasn't actually what I wanted to do and it didn't excite me. And I didn't have a career path. I just like sharks. So let's get a degree in marine biology. I didn't have, I like sharks and I'm going to go do this. It was, I like sharks and I need a degree. Um, at the time I called it burnt out. In retrospect, I was not on the right path or a path. And then like the windiness ensued. Well, which is interesting because I've, I've talked about this before, right? Is it's like so much, so much, we, we all get on different paths during our life. And a lot of times the paths that we get onto are not the right path. I call it, you know, a path with heart, right? That, that the problem is if you're on a path that you don't have heart for, that doesn't have heart, eventually that path will kill you right? Or it will, like you said, life will show up and say, thank you, but no thanks, right? You're not playing this game anymore. And, and people can continue to go down that path. But if it's not the path you're supposed to be on, you will keep getting hammered, right? And, and so like you said, right? I mean, you couldn't get an $8 an hour job scrubbing boats because no, you have to have a master's degree to do that, right? Yeah. I mean, you might as well have gone and worked at a local restaurant, right? But then it would have been I, six I was, bucks I was hour. making three six, times three. that working at a restaurant at the time. And I was literally willing to live in my Volkswagen down by the river in order to do that job. And I still eight bucks. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. So 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 how did how did you come to because like you said, I mean, <laughs> you've had this, other people listening, you know, have this. Yeah. How did how did you come to decide, okay, well, what is it? I got to get off this path, but what am I gonna do yeah. now? Right. Yeah. And I think one thing, because we talked about this uh, prior to hitting record, I think is good for some people in, in the audience or that might be listening to this. The punchline of all of that, when I looked back on it, is that I chose sharks, tagging sharks, being in the water, being on a boat, everything around sharks, some, some big, terrible sharks, right? Not just like cute little sharks, even though some people might think there's no such thing as a cute little shark. Um, I literally chose that as the safest and best career path versus humans. Because of all the stuff that we talked about with the childhood, I was like, I definitely don't want to go into a career dealing with people. In fact, when I was in college, I got a job at a restaurant as a busser. And I was like, okay, fine. I'll deal with plates and glasses and water, but I definitely don't want to deal with hungry people because I see how my parents and how I get when I'm hungry. I don't want to, A, I don't want to deal with people and definitely not hungry people. And then I realized I was actually pretty good at it and they made me a server. And then I was like, Hey, I'm really good at this. And like the fact that I wasn't trying and I just approach things like my parent, my parents raised me by going out to restaurants a lot. So I was a good customer and I just treat people like I was raised. We would want servers to be, and I just, did that and it worked really well. Um, so after marine biology moved to Seattle and uh, ended up getting a job at Microsoft, I thought, hey, I've become good with people. I'm, I'm all right with like customer service. The sales is still nowhere on my radar. Um, I like computers. I know some stuff. Hey, let me get my foot in the door with computers by doing tech support, which is just problem solving with people and a little bit of technical knowledge. Um, that was back when tech support was still done in the US. In fact, after two years, we all lost our jobs to China and India for the first time it was ever outsourced by Microsoft in 2002. Um, prior to that, it was done by people in offices in the US. And um, I realized after about six months of doing that job out of my two years, I really didn't like computers or technical stuff. And what I realized um, 
in retrospect in my next career after that was I would come back on, on a Monday and I would talk to my coworkers and my coworkers would be like, yeah, I was doing this with my motherboard and I changed my jumpers. And did you guys see this, you know, video card monthly? And I was reading motherboard quarterly the other, you know, and it's like their weekends were around computers and programming. And I'm like, yeah, I have a girlfriend and I played some basketball and I went to a movie. Like I, I, I literally, they're passionate about it. And I was like, I don't get it. And then I realized later on, I realized like when you know, you know, because I found myself in a career later on where I was that nerd reading like banking quarterly financial reports and like, you know, real estate things. And I was like, I'm now that guy. Like I'm excited to dog ear the banking news magazine and highlight it and run around the office telling people. And I was like, oh, that's what that is. Okay. That's when you've kind of found this groove. Um, so yeah, so I went to tech support and then from there in 2002, um, I got a job in, a, at a mortgage company helping people. It was the height of the real estate boom in Seattle. Um, didn't learn anything about sales. Wasn't trained on sales. Have never been trained on sales. Have never been taught anything about sales scripts, objections. Uh, it was the, the height of the real estate boom. So it was pure order taking for years. Literally everyone was just begging for loans. Um, it wasn't until I transitioned to helping people in foreclosure that I really learned human nature, fears, persuasion, what it takes, the cost of failure from a sales perspective. Um, still had to learn it all on my own, but that's where that journey began. And in, in around 2004, where I started to realize what I was doing was selling and persuasion. Yet I never used the word sales uh, because sales to me was the gross, dirty car sales stuff, not what I was doing because I was helping people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's, it's funny. Cause you know, again, I'm, I've lived through all those same times too, right? So I've, I've sitting there going, Oh, mortgages, 2004. All right. Well, we're going to get to the 2008, 2009 probably, but, but it's, but it's interesting. Again, I, I, I find it, you know, like you said, fascinating to where, cause I always like to try to give people clues. Cause a lot of time people are like, I don't know what I want to do. I'm not happy here, but I don't know what I want to do. Right. And it's like, yeah. no, we all probably already kind of really know underneath, maybe, maybe something hasn't come into our awareness yet. Like, gosh, I didn't know you could make money doing that, right? Sort yeah. of a thing. I mean, I'm always finding things like that, but it's interesting, like you said, I mean, that, that story of working at Microsoft. And everybody else is like nerding out about, you know, like you said, there probably is such a thing as Motherboard Weekly or whatever, right? Yeah. <laughs> there probably really yeah. is a magazine called that. But, but, you know, to where their passion is outside of work, but it's also aligned with their work, right? I mean, they, they do love, you like computers, but they like love computers, right? You liked sharks, but you didn't love it right? right and i'm kind of getting that's where the difference is in the passion right is that all of a sudden when you started seeing yourself passionate outside of the job for certain things that's when you're like hold it i think i might have found yeah. my thing right yeah for sure and that's what's interesting too because for the longest time and i've gotten better in the in in recent years but people would say like, what are your hobbies? Or I got to fill out some form. It says, what are your hobbies? My hobbies is business. What do you do when you're not working? I read about business and I like business podcasts and I read business books or psychology books or anything relative to that, right? I work, a, you know, a, a full schedule. And then when I'm not working, I don't know what else I'm doing, but I might be thinking about business. Um, and, you know, obviously not an unhealthy workaholic mode, but that's just what my brain likes. And for the longest time, I judged myself and I was like, oh, that's so terrible. I don't have hobbies. And it's like, then I met other people who were like, yeah, it's like love business. I enjoy business and people and strategies and operations and solving problems and making a bigger impact like in those realms. And it's like, oh, that's my brain is just always spinning on that. Hmm. Well, and so, yeah, so let's, so let's go. Cause again, I'm, I'm curious right like what happened because again i i you know so two th we, we kind of a 2004 ish time frame right so you're you're kind yep. of working in in mortgage in the mortgage business i know you said you kind of moved over to like foreclosure 
kind of stuff. Yeah. So, so 2004, I stopped doing mortgages, which most people would say that's stupid because it was still the height of the real estate boom. Uh, I left making a bunch of money because it didn't feel fulfilling and it didn't feel, it, it, it didn't matter to me. And I just personally struggled with the thought of helping people buy houses and get into large amount of debts, most likely people who probably shouldn't buy houses and shouldn't get into that debt and probably can't afford it. And my kind of like underdog anti-American dream, the requirement to be successful in life is to own a home, right? From that like emotional standpoint. And so I was like, I, just, I don't enjoy this. Like it's not fun. And other people around me are, you know, cash and checks. And I'm just like, eh, eh. What else is there? And yeah, there um, was a lot of money made between then and 2008. Was. I know, I know a lot of people in the mortgage business. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and some people I know stuck it out and it's great for them. Right. And it's not even a negative about it. It was just like, for me, that wasn't, that didn't sing to me. Uh, and not even in a follow your passion. Cause we can have a whole different discussion about the, the passion myth. Um, but I mean, just like a, it didn't matter. I didn't feel like I was doing anything. Um, so then I went into business. I started a company with a friend of mine, helping people who were in foreclosure, who had an auction date, who, you know, in 90 days, you yeah. the sheriff will come and kick you out if you don't do something about it. And so that's when I started learning that was in 2004. So we're talking pre housing meltdown, there were still so many foreclosures. Um, I did that on my own for a few years, found out I really suck at being self employed that first time around, I've gotten a bit better at it now. Um, I made all the mistakes that a lot of people made during the pandemic. Now, I made them back in 2004 to 2006, where I was taking naps, I was running errands, I was, ah, it's a good time to go pick up my dry cleaning in the afternoon, like, anything but actually working. I made all those mistakes then. Then I went to work for a company. The difference was, and I never thought I was in sales, even when I was doing that. I never thought that's what I was doing. And then I went to work for a company. They had a director of sales. I came in as the director of ops of a startup. I was like, this is perfect. I'm an operations guy. And I'll tell you, even to this day, this is what I tell my clients and tell companies. I am a at heart, I am an operations guy. I look at things like an operation and I want to fix it or build it or make it better. I just also happen to be really good at sales and persuasion in a way that I think benefits everybody. Uh, but I'm really at heart an operations guy, which makes me so different. So I went to that company, worked as director of operations, which was good for me because they set them up. I processed everything. We built all the systems. Uh, they fired the director of sales. Uh, later that day, the CEO comes to me and says, hey, by the way, he's gone. Uh, you're now the VP of sales and ops. Uh, you have 10 salespeople, three telemarketers. Uh, the direct mail's not working well. Uh, you need to build a process that works and train everybody. And then we also need to grow. And I'd never trained anybody. I had never wrote a script. I, had, I didn't even think I was in sales. Uh, so it was trial by fire with his help. Um, it was actually in that mode where I did my first training program. And I realized sales, training, leadership, it's all public speaking. I went into Toastmaster. I did Toastmasters for two years, once a week, because I saw that it was all communication. Um, again, that's why I meet so many people and they're like, oh, you must have always been this way. I'm like, I promise. If you even look, I, sometimes on presentations, even on stage, I will show pictures of me as a kid and what I look like. And you can easily see like, oh yeah, no, that's, it's definitely <laughs> night and day definitely night and day, right? Like, so that kind of threw me into it. Um, looking at sales from an operation side, and then building it and figuring out how to be effective. And here's the big key. And before you, you get in, I know you have some questions too. The thing was, is that I was raised in mortgages where somebody calls, the first thing you do is get them in the office in person or go meet with them. Don't do everything over anything over the phone. Don't try to sell over the phone. Don't do anything. Relationship build face to face, eye to eye, build trust, get them to trust you, pick you over everybody else that wants their business. And then you can move over the phone once you have the relationship instantly over the phone. When I started in the foreclosure days, anyone called me or I called them and actually got them on the phone. First thing, Hey, I'll be at your house. I'll be at your house in 15 minutes and then do everything that way. When I went to work for that startup, the goal and the focus was 100% phone-based, dealing with someone who's losing their house, helping them keep their house, save their house, sell it, whatever it was, all over the phone. I literally didn't think it was possible. I was like, that's not possible. You can't sell over the phone. It's all done in person. Um, so I had to learn a whole bunch of new skills and abilities when you can't uh, cheat with the face-to-face. 
Yeah, because it is it is different, and that, actually, it brings up you know a lot of stuff that that I've been hearing people talking about for the last two years, right? In in kind of the the you know work from home now because of all the stuff that's gone on in the world for the last two years, right? And it's and so many people are they're they're struggling because it's like I I know how to manage people in person or how to you know shoot the shit at the water cooler with people in person, yeah. but. But now, even when we're doing video, it's like it's different, right? It's it's kind of some same principles, but different kind of techniques, right? Which it sounds like you had to kind of learn there, you know, as you went from kind of the face to face sales and relationship to doing something on the phone with people. Yeah, and I think anybody who tries to make that transition from face to face to phone sales, uh, even virtual sales, but mostly the phone sales you'll find out if you have the skills or not, or if you're willing to learn them. I honestly think if you are in face-to-face -face sales and you're not any good at it, like you're, you, that's terrible, right? I think face-to-face -face is cheating and easy, right? Because what, 90 something percent of, of what we get from people is nonverbal. It's like, come on, now turn all that off and then just do it over the phone, mm -hmm. trying to help somebody make a decision they're scared of. Um, and then in the same way that I was dealing with organizations before the pandemic, and then since then, it's been really highlighted, which is um, you will know if you have a good operation, a good organization, and a good company culture, if you do well when everyone goes remote. If you require face-to-face -face management by walking around, micromanaging by standing over shoulders or having meetings, I promise you don't have a very good, well-organized, good culture organization. No, you don't. You don't. Well, and, and and so so you get up to this this point, right? Which again, I, I know a lot of times in our career, you just kind of get given. I could yep. hopefully they hopefully they paid you more money too, right? It's like every time my CEO would come to me and say, Jason, by the way, you're gonna start doing this now too. I never got a raise, but hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you got a raise. But here here I am sitting here thinking and I'm like, how's he going to go home and tell his parents what his new job is now with your yeah. mom hating salespeople? Yeah. How did that discussion go? <laughs> I don't remember it. I think I might've blocked that out as well. Um, you know, it, it's one of those things where because of how I was raised and because of, you know, they know how they raised me and how I am is that it wasn't about going into it and selling in, in a different mode in sales mode. It was still like, even with that title, it was still about helping people and, and of service, even though I couldn't have verbalized that at the time, like I can now, like the process of writing my book that came out a few years ago really made me look backwards and look at what I've done to be successful and help others do to be successful. And then really like, Oh, that's what I was doing at the time. I was on autopilot. I was just going with intuition and gut and how I, wanted to, you know, sell like I like to buy, and then also realizing the pitfalls of that and how to adjust. Um, so yeah, it was definitely, it was definitely interesting running that and then managing other people and getting them to sell and the challenges that come with, you know, dealing with team members, with staff, with humans. Well, that's why, because I, I want to go, I know, you, you know, you've got your book, Selling with Authentic Persuasion, right? Yeah. Which two of those words, really important for me right authentic and persuasion the selling no i'm <laughs> i'm kidding right <laughs> but 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 what's interesting and again because you know what kind of stood out to me is that bringing that authenticity to it right and and again some of the people listening might be in a sales role but you know i got to do the timeout and remind everybody that regardless of what job you are in you are selling yourself every single day right? You're selling your company, you're selling yourself, you know, and so there are certain aspects as we talk a little bit about some of these things now that you might think, well, but I, I'm not, I'm not in sales. You are in sales, right? And, and these principles that you're teaching and that you're talking about are the same principles for anybody, right? To help them in their relationships, being more authentic and helping to be able to persuade people, whether it's a business or in your personal life as well, right? Because it's, it's all the same principles and it just takes practice and learning how to do it. Because like you've shown, right? You can learn new things. It's, it's, not, it's not you're born this way. Everybody's born this way. We think that, 
but none of those people that look like they're born that way were actually born that way, folks. <laughs> it doesn't happen. Except yeah. except for this, the six-year-old kids that start selling when they're six. Maybe those well, and people that's do. The, but. And, and that's the big difference, right? And that's what I, I wrote in there. And I, I really coach people on who are on that other end of the spectrum, right? Because the subtitle of the book is transformed from order taker to quota breaker. And it's the order takers who they see sales as boiler room, Wolf of Wall Street, that's gross, that's used car salesperson. I promise and vow never to do that to somebody else because I would hate it being done to me. Like the golden rule, they end up at the other extreme, which is just order takers, which is if I'm nice and I build relationships, hopefully people will like me and then they'll want to buy from me, right? And, and, and hopefully that will happen. Um, but that usually happens because people think, oh, they're just born that way, right? The nature versus nurture. Um, and I think what it really is, and this is my thesis, is that it's not that they're born that way. It's but literally they've been doing it a long time. If you're a fan of Malcolm Gladwell and 10,000 mm -hmm. hours, if somebody at four, five, six years old realizes they can persuade people to do things and then they lean into that, just like you see these child stars and child actor musicians and you see footage of them as a kid. They realize that works, and then they just do that for the next 20 years. You meet them in, the, in their mid-20s, they've, they've got 20,000 hours into persuading people to do good or bad things, right? It's not that they were born that way. They just, they've been practicing. Well, and I think that's, that's it's what's so funny because, again, like you said, I think most people look at, look at others, and they think, oh, they were just born that way. Or I love, you know, like, like actors or other people like that, who, who you sit there and think, you know, comedians are another one, right? I just listened to a podcast with a couple of comedians, guys that I love from Saturday Night Live, right? And, and it's, and it's, um, you know, we, we think again, you know, like, like when they have their, their big break, right? They get hired by Saturday Night Live, or, you know, they get the HBO special or whatever, right? It's like, it's like, Oh, you know, uh, success just showed up and you're so lucky. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, where the fuck were you for the last 20 years? Yeah. Right. When I've been doing jokes at family writing events and I've been writing it out and I've been, you know, playing, playing in, you know, the shithole bars all over the country, right. Trying to get seen and finally picked up. Right. It's we, we forget that success usually does require that practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if somebody does have an overnight success, right? Like I think of, cause I, I grew up and spent most of my time living in California in the Bay area. You see these people who are overnight success. Some of them might be a young, brilliant, gifted person that just hits it and is successful. Many times the challenge is if you don't have that experience, you don't have the foundation, you can't maintain it. Right. And I'm not mm -hmm. saying like, Oh, they just going to come and go, but like, you know, you see a lot of people who get it, they have a spike, but they don't have the experience to make it through it. And then they crash back down and they go up and they crash, and then they figure it out. Like, okay, now I've got, well, and, that's, and, the, and you see that a lot in the tech companies, right? I mean, again, even, you know, you take, we'll, we'll just take Steve jobs, right? Cause he's, he's yeah. a perfect example of that. You know, there was a lot behind their success early on too, right? It wasn't just like, boom, but he did, he jumped up very quickly. But then it got to a point, right, where you need some help. You got to kind of level to the next point. And there's a lot of, yeah. especially tech entrepreneurs that, you know, their business gets bought out. Somebody else comes in above them, kind of takes over their company, um, forces them out, or they've got a lot of upskilling to try to do to be able to, to, to make up for it. And you can see that, like I said, in the tech industry, especially um, is, is famous for that you know, up North, but, but so, so what are, what are some of these things, you know, again, that, that, that people can do? Cause again, people need to go out and buy your book as well. Right. But what's maybe, you know, one or two things that's helped you and that you kind of share with people just so, you know, people listening today can go, Oh, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to start trying to practice this, this week. What, what are, what are some of the things that you, that you teach people about how to be, you know, more authentic in, in, in how to persuade. 
and, and persuade yeah, so, versus manipulate, right? Because that's the other yes. thing that people mix yeah, up. Yeah, so and much. it's important. And you know, and and Brian Ahern, who you had on the show, and he's a great guy. Uh, you know, he used the word influence. Cialdini uses the word influence. You can interchange it. You can look at the definitions. You can wordsmith stuff back and forth. No matter what, it's the the anti manipulation, right? We're not we're not trying to do something yeah. against somebody else's will. I think for the the highlights from the authentic side is understanding that there is no one personality behavior mode for being effective in sales, right? We might see that in movies, but we also remember how most of those movies end. Um, and I think that's pretty, pretty accurate, right? A lot of people think, oh, if I'm not extroverted, if I'm not charismatic, if I'm not over the top, if I'm not the center of attention, if I don't walk into a room and I have to get everyone's energy, like people aren't going to buy from me. And I would contest that most people like that person, they're drawn to them, but they don't overly trust them. And it might not work out long term. We can look at some stats if anyone wants to battle me on that. Um, but like you be you, um, kind of like dogs and animals can sense fear people prospects people you're talking to they can sense if you're being real or not especially in this day and age here's the biggest thing that's different is 2022 right um not too long ago the two jasons remember and i talked about it earlier if you wanted to buy a car you had to go to a dealership and you had to ask them about the car and the information and the price or wait for the Sunday newspaper or get an auto trader. When that came out, that was revolutionary. But the mm -hmm. salesperson in the company had all the power. They had the, all the knowledge and information and you had to suffer through them. People don't now, right? Everyone's got within arm's reach 24 hours a day, all the world's information. And so they know about you. They know about what's going on. They want the authentic you and you just be you. As long as you're not offensive, uh, which some people would say, just be you no matter what. And you're going to, you know, people are going to like you where they're not. Um, but, you know, in terms of being professional is just do it, right? If you're awkward, if you're funny, if you like stats and spreadsheets, just don't worry about having to fit a mold. Also leverage your strengths. The big thing that I wrote about in there too is, is leveraging, acknowledging your strengths versus trying to fix them or fix your weaknesses. Like, what are you strong at? If you're strong in a certain way, go all in on that and don't worry about it unless there's something you could improve. Like I said, like weakness, public speaking. So that's something that was worth fixing, getting better at, improving, practicing, putting in the hours, right? Where does that fit in for you? Um, I think really with the authentic side, and, and here's the one of the keys is that I have what I call the sales success traits, which are more important to me than anything else when it comes to extrovert, charisma, introvert, like all of these other terms people might throw out is, and, and the five of them, I'll, I'll give you all five, is openness, curiosity, creativity, persistence, and authenticity. So openness, curiosity, curiosity. creativity. Yep. Creativity, persistence, and authenticity. And they're in an order in particular, based on what I've seen over thousand plus salespeople, plus myself, most people think, oh, if you want to be in sales to be effective, you have to have persistent. Well, if you're not open and curious and you're not open to new ideas and you don't actually ask questions and listen and learn to your prospects, you're just a persistent asshole. who's <laughs> probably self-centered, yeah. uh -huh. right? And we've all met that person and we've all had that person call us relentlessly and they, we know they don't care about us. But if you're open and you're curious, you will learn, you'll be open to new ideas, You'll listen to podcasts, you'll read books, you'll study things, you'll take feedback, you're curious about your prospects, right? That's why most podcast hosts are so great at it. If they're just curious, just ask questions and, and throw the ball up and see where it goes because you just want to know. Um, and so if you're in any kind of a sales role and you just leverage those things, open and curious, you'll be successful more than anything else. Then the rest of it kind of comes into line. Well, which is interesting because those are the same those are two of the same things that I teach people, right? From relationship building, you know, in, in, in general um, as well, right? Because, because, and this is one thing that, um, especially as of late, you know, that really has hit home to me is we're so judgmental. And the interesting thing is when, when we're judgmental, that usually elicits a particular emotion in us. Right. So, so you say something to me and I take offense at it and I'm kind of offended and I judge you like, what the hell, Connor? You know, it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. right. Yeah. Well, I'm starting to, to already judge 
you or give some sort of judgment about what it is that you say. And that leads to an emotion in me that often is negative, as opposed to me going, hey, man, I'm just curious, why, why, why'd you say it that way? Why'd you use that word? Right. If I'm more curious about it, you can't be curious and judgmental at the same time. And it allows you to understand the other person from a communication standpoint and get to actually know the other person. Right. That, that those two, especially, and I love that those are the ones that you start with. Because so much of the time people are trying to go up the scale, but if you don't have the foundation, you're never going to get up the scale. You said, right, you're a persistent asshole instead of, <laughs> instead of somebody that they know, like, and trust. Yeah. And that's important, right? Because that's the foundation. That's why with the book and the process, it's not persuasive authenticity. It's authentic persuasion. Because a lot of people come to me and they're like, what should I say? How do I build the sales process? What's the best question to ask? How do I close more deals? Like, what's the best close? Like, blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, none of that matters unless you have the foundation, right? It's like any skill, right? If you have never worked on a car before, I could give you the tools and tell you what to do. But if you have no idea the basics, it will not matter. You will mess it all up. Um, and yeah, I think those are the most important things, even for companies when we rebuild their recruiting process, because it's usually done in the wrong way. It's about finding those attributes in alignment with the company culture and everything else is easy, right? If someone's open and curious, how much sales experience they have, how polished they are, doesn't matter because they're open and curious. I, we can, we, we will rebuild them, right? We will find a way uh, and they will be successful if they have those. Um, and I, in my opinion, one of the traits that I've seen from a lot of people I've interviewed uh, on my podcast is, you know, they either say grit or curiosity to be a great salesperson who yeah. does great things and helps people. Curiosity, just be ultra, ultra curious because you at the intersection of curiosity and answering, finding out, asking questions and finding out what they want, you will find out how to help somebody if you know where you're going, which is the persuasion piece, right? Because we don't want to make authentic order takers who are homeless under a bridge, but really authentic. We want people to be successful as well. Well, and what it allows to, you know, because like you said, and, and this is, it applies outside of sales too, folks. Okay. So just again, so you're remembering that, but, but you know, to me, that's always a difference too, you know, because we always use like the sleazy car salesman. It's, it's just easy to pick on those guys, you know. Right. Now, a lot of them are pretty much order takers too, because it's like, I know exactly what I want. I've already built it. I just got to go pick it up, pay for it, right? I mean, that's where we're moving. But but, but there's kind of that sleaziness to it. Like like they're, they're, they're trying to, you know, get the deal done, you know, regardless, I just want to sell you a car versus kind of the approach that you're, that you're bringing out, which you know, and, and I would call that in my, in my words, I call that transactional, right? So I'm just trying to have a transaction with you, right? Versus, you know, being open, being curious, because when you do that, you actually start to understand, you know, what it, what it is that somebody really needs, what somebody really wants. And until you know that, right, you don't know what's kind of the best fit for them. Right. So it's, it's like, <clears throat> I've got different programs and, and things that I offer, but in, until I talk to somebody for 15 minutes, it's like, I don't know which one is right for you. I don't know. Right. But, it, but if you let me talk to you for 15 minutes and you tell me what your hopes and dreams are and what you want to accomplish, and it's like, well, actually this one's probably better for you. Right. You know, yeah, I'll make a lot more money if you do this other one, but what you really need is this one. Right. And, and to me, it's kind of that seems too to be kind of the basis behind it is then helping people get what they want. It's just usually that's in a product or service, right? That's going, I mean, that's why we buy these things, right? Is they they help us out. I gotta have a car to go to to go to work unless I'm working from home. <laughs> and, and and that's ultimately kind of I think too the, the the whole idea behind and probably why you love sales and what you're doing so much now because you still see it as helping people because you're developing and, 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 uh, and doing more of a relationship type of transaction, instead of just seeing the person as a transaction, you see them as a person. Yeah. And 
that is, it was a really tough transition for me in my career because I went from long sales cycle, long relationships, helping someone in real estate slash foreclosure where you're sometimes dealing. I, I remember one, one woman I dealt with for 18 months throughout the whole process. That is a long relationship, longer than maybe other relationships in life. And I'm dealing with this customer for 18 months and then it was done and then it was over. After that, I went into shorter sales cycle where successful sales was a one call, one hour conversation, one and done. And then you never talk to them again. And that felt weird because it was like, I'm used to relationships and building it. And so you still have, like, for me, I just went into that mode where it's like, I still want the best for you. Even if I never talk to you and I don't know what's going to happen, like how, if you're going to be successful and what the long-term is, I'm still going to do it in this way. And really that just requires faith and trust in abundance that there's 7 billion people on the planet. I don't need to sell each person right? Yeah. Trying to do so is gross and we all can't stand it, right? When I walk through the mall and now these kiosks that are in there and you walk by and they think that everyone needs what it is that they're trying to sell. No, I don't need a wig. No, I don't need women's cologne, like our perfume. Like, no, like stop. You're, you don't even care about me. It's all transactional. Um, but when you trust and rely on abundance, that there's enough people out there, then you don't need to put square pegs in round holes, you can just find the people you can help. Yeah. I mean, you just, I, I know that was one of the, the suggestions that I got to, or, you know, one of my coaches said, you got to separate the money from the work. Right. And, and it's the same kind of thing. So it's like, anytime I'm talking to somebody, it's about just trying to help that person. Mm -hmm. Right. And again, I might not have anything that, that would help them, but if I show up and I serve them for that time period, like you said, it comes back to you, right? Because again, if you, if you treat human beings the right way, yeah, it always comes back to you. I, I actually, it was just funny. I, I, I just talked yesterday with, with somebody who I, I worked with 10 years ago, 10 years ago, I haven't talked to her in 10 years. Right. And it's, it's, and again, this is not me. It's just the way I try to live my life. Right. Is I always try to, to, to do the right thing, to be kind to other people, to leave people better off than I found them, if you will. Right. And, and it was surprising, you know, again, it's like where she was like, yeah, I always really liked working with you, you know, kind of a thing. And it's like, ah, oh, you know, I haven't seen her in 10 years, but obviously I was doing something right back then, you know, and, it, and it's like, if we just show up and do right by people every day, yeah, people remember that we make their lives better, but you never know too, like you said, from an abundance perspective, you never know how it's going to come back to you at some point in the future. And I've literally had people where I've known them for five years before they ever buy anything from me. It's cool. I like them. I still, you know, but it's, it's sometimes people, it's just not right for them at that time. So separating the two, instead of thinking about that other person as a transaction it's just interesting that you that you brought that up because I that's one of the things I've gotten told too. And it makes a huge yeah. difference in how you feel too, because it's not you don't feel like, oh, if I don't make that sale, you know, and all that pressure that goes on it, it allows you to be more authentic and open in who you are. Or I push that person into it because I needed the sale and that, you know, that causes the how do you sleep at night mode right? Mm -hmm. In sales, or when people ask somebody in sales, like, how do you sleep at night with what you do, right? Because they think sales is just about manipulation and pushing people. And I would say the one big caveat to what you said, which is also how I feel and what I put in my book and, and the stuff that I do is that, yes, lean on abundance. Yes, 7 billion people on the planet. Yes, do the right thing. Help the people you can help. And, and I even have a chapter in there that says the power of saying no, right? Telling the wrong people no, and actually how valuable that is in many different instances that I, I won't cover here, but like emotionally, energetically, and business wise, where it's valuable. The biggest caveat, the biggest big print, I won't even say small print, is that you still can't be an order taker with that mode because I see a lot of people who lean on abundance, 7 billion people on the planet. Jason said there's more than enough. So I'm just going to know, like, and trust. I'm going to use Bob Berg's and I'm going to stop there, which yeah. means I'm going to get people to know, like, and trust me. If they trust me, hopefully they'll just hand me cash. Um, and that doesn't work either. That makes you a broke, unemployed salesperson. 
And what you have to have is the persuasion piece. That's why that was so okay. important uh, in what I focus on, which is you have to use persuasion. You have to have a sales system and a process scripting is so important and not to make you sound like a robot, but like the things that need to be scripted, you have to, you have to know where you're going in the conversation mixed with abundance and sales being service. Well, yeah. And because it's, it's when, when you go back to, you know, ultimately it's the other person's choice because we're not, we're not trying to, you know, shouldn't be manipulating anybody trying to sell yep. them anything that they don't need or want, but it's, it really is that helping people and, and where, like you said, where, where the value really comes in there is by us just kind of nudging, giving people the nudge, they're just afraid to take, right? So a lot of times it's like, people know that, you know, doing this, whatever it is, right? Buying this product, buying this service, doing whatever it is, is going to make their life better, but they're just afraid of changing. They're afraid of doing the investment. And sometimes they just need a little nudge to do what they already know they want to do, but they're just afraid to do it. And so I think that's, that's another great way. And like you said, that's where the persuasion comes in. It's like, you're just trying to help the person see well, th this is what you want, isn't it? I mean, th this is what you've been telling me that you want. So yeah. you know, how long are you going to wait to have this? I mean, you could walk out today with it or, you know, do you want to go through the same pain for the next three months and come back three months from now? <laughs> right. And, and there's, there's all little ways of, of doing stuff to be able to just help us make the decision that we want to make anyway and be okay with it. And the only thing I would say counter ish to that is, counter away because you're the expert man <laughs> the nudge is good sometimes people just need a little nudge the fundamental thing and this is what i've been training a lot of people on over the last year is that everybody who you're talking to that could be a potential customer is all afraid of one thing which you mentioned and it's tough people say well how could they be all afraid of the same thing like they're all afraid of the same thing they're all afraid of change buying from you is change if they weren't afraid of change i promise they would have called you and said Hey, hey, Jay, uh, I like what you're doing and I'd like to sign up. I have my card ready. Um, just let me know when uh, you want the numbers because I'm ready to go. That person, we've all dealt with them. They're not afraid of change. They're, great. they're ready to go, <laughs> going. Good. Now you're an order taker. You're doing paperwork, processing cards. Fantastic. Congrats. For everyone else, if they're talking to you, if they're risking life and limb and everything that they know to deal with a salesperson who could fleece them and screw them over, it's because they're afraid of change, but they know they kind of need it or want it. They're stuck in their comfort zone. And I have this model that I've created for this, but they're stuck in their comfort zone. The amygdala part of their brain still thinks it's a nomad hundred thousand years ago out on the plains and change equals death. Buying from you is death, right? Um, that's what you're up against. Some people, it's a nudge. Some people, you have to drag them out of their comfort zone for their benefit. And it takes you being a leader as a salesperson, not a sales leader, but you being a leader of the conversation. More of like for some people and, and what I teach is not the, hey, you can see how this is a benefit, right? It's like, well, based on what you told me, this is a benefit. You agree? Okay, sounds good. Now the next part is that I need to get your information for the application, right? Like we're just going. I know where we're going. When you go to the doctor, right? And they run their tests and they do their exams. The doctor doesn't come back and say, you have a brain tumor. Here's what could be done. Is this something you'd be interested in doing today? Here's the benefits of brain surgery. You know, I don't, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking Jason, that you probably have somebody you need to talk to, or maybe get this approved, or I don't know if you have the money or the budget. So what I'm going to do, you know what I'm going to do, Jason, I'm going to send you an email um, with some information, with some links, you can do some research. Here's a brochure on brain surgery. Um, you just let me know. I'll follow up with you. Maybe next week I'll, I'll give you a call and check in and see if this is something you'd like to do and move forward with. That was the perfect example, <laughs> right? Right. Because, because, no, that would be malpractice. No, no, no. See, the yeah. difference, 
Yeah. yeah. It, it would absolutely be malpractice because the difference is a doctor went to school, took a test, held to standards, has a code of ethics, took an oath and has, uh, is held to standards where if they violate that it's malpractice. Salespeople are not, there's no test. Even when I went into mortgages in 2002, Washington state didn't even require you to be licensed to sell mortgages. I wasn't even licensed to know anything about mortgages and there is no license for sales. So everyone yeah. is just a renegade. Um, and no, the doctor says you have a tumor. We need to get this fixed. You need to clear your calendar. Uh, do you have any questions before we begin? Cause I got to take you in right now. They assume the living shit out of it. Now, most people aren't selling life and death. You don't have that leverage, but when you right. operate in that mode in your conversations where you're the professional who can help them, you owe it to them to be the professional and move them forward. Not asking for permission, but if you know, you can help somebody, you owe it to them. Yeah. No, I think it's like I said, it's, it's a great example because, you know, what you were just saying, we would never expect our doctor to say those things that you just said, but we hear salespeople say it all the time. I've said those same things in different I've conversations, yep. you know, um, and yeah, that it's really, and, and when you think about it in, in, you know, that kind of a way from an analogy perspective. That's why I think that was such a great analogy is, is there's literally, I mean, some stuff that I do, and I'm sure that you do too, where it's like, you know, I know you might be scared about the change. I know it's probably more money than you've ever invested in your life. Mm -hmm. But I also know if you don't do this, I know where your life is going to continue to go. It's like, it's your choice. But, you know, if you want to get rid of the pain, then this is what you need to do, right? So let's get going, <laughs> yeah. right? Let's not pussyfoot around. I mean, again, it's like you you totally have the choice. You know, like you, like you said, you go to the doctor and the doctor tells you you got brain cancer. I'm like, thanks doc. I'm gonna go home and die on my own. I'm not going through all the stuff. You know, yep. I have that choice if I wanna do that, yep. right? just like anybody else has the choice from a sales perspective too. But, you know, think about it instead of it being an icky thing where you're trying to manipulate somebody, think of it as, you know, again, if it's something that you believe in, if that you believe benefits people, if it's not, then maybe you need to change jobs too. Right. But um, that's neither here nor there, but, but, but that kind of obligation of, if you know, somebody needs your help, you have an obligation to do everything you can to give them that help, which is, again, it's another kind of twist on most people don't think about it that way, but obviously it sounds like you do. So, yeah. And, and I have an analogy for that, where I tell people when I train them, it's their duty D U T Y in capital letters driven until the yes. Once you know, right, and this is after a certain point, like you were talking about earlier, like determining if it's a good fit, if you can help somebody, like if you can make, get them to a better place, personally, professionally, whatever that is, at that moment, when you realize you can, it is your duty to, to give it everything you can, um, is to get them unstuck out of their comfort zone over their fears, um, in a way that's authentic that's empathetic and you're helping them. And then you're literally getting them to a better place, even if they're scared. Well, and it's even, <clears throat> you know, again, a lot of these, I told you we were going to talk about sales and other stuff and we are talking about that, but we're not talking about that too, right? <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's one of those where, you know, because uh, I do a lot of stuff about nice versus kind as well, right? That, hmm. that you know, we want to, you know, so many of us want to just be nice, just be the nice person, right? But a lot of times being nice is not being kind. Because sometimes, you know, if you're kind, if you're truly kind, and you're truly loving, let's say to, to, to a family member or a friend, you're going to call them out on their shit. If they need to be called out on, you're going to help them kind of get through the change that they're scared of doing, you know, as well, because it might not seem like the nice thing to do, but in the long term, it's the kind thing to do. And it's yep. the same, same sort of a sense that I kind of got from what you were talking about there of having the duty is, you know, look, I know what you're going through. I know what you're going to go through. And 
do you still want to keep going through that or can we just help you not have to deal with that anymore totally different conversation right so yeah Ooh, good stuff good stuff all right well you know again i like to talk so here we go <laughs> <laughs> but i know you know i i want to make sure you know again i know we we talked about your book selling with authentic persuasion is one of the books that you have i know you do a podcast as well so just give people a little bit you know heads up on on podcast name and um so they can reach out to that because obviously if they're listening to this i like podcasts and we don't all just listen to one podcast we listen to lots of podcasts so if they like, if they're listening to this, they like podcasts hosted by a guy named Jason. Well, I just happen to have <laughs> one like that too. Uh, <laughs> so my main podcast is called The Authentic Persuasion Show. I rebranded it. Originally, it was called The Sales Experience Podcast. Then when my book came out, I, I renamed it. Um, and it's sales, sales leadership. It's, you know, uh, I'm kind of crazy. So most of the time I'm doing five episodes a week. And, uh, so it's, it's really anything around that. You can find that everywhere. Podcasts are sold, uh, the authentic persuasion show, uh, the book you can get on Amazon. There's hardcover, there's, uh, audible, which was fun to do the audio version. And by did you, did, really did you do the read on it? Did you do the read I, on I it? I did. You know, what's funny. So funny side note yeah. on this, um, hopefully people haven't tuned this out by now, but if you have, okay. Um, funny side note on this. I was like, you know what? I was, I got into a big outsourcing, all of the things in my life mode when, when like I wanted to do the audiobook, and I was like, let me find some, I can find somebody on Fiverr who could literally do a voiceover. And I even got samples and like audition tapes of people reading the first chapter. I was like, okay, this dude sounds like Morgan Freeman. That's a little weird. Um, but <laughs> that might, so I literally built a site a, a, a non-public landing page with these audio clips of people and then like a survey. And I sent it to my network and I said, Hey, everybody, what do you think? What would you like? And everybody, I just felt like absolute shit all weekend. Cause everyone was like, your book is called authentic persuasion. You want to be on stage. You want to train companies. Uh, you need to be the one reading it. It would be very inauthentic if someone else read your book. And if you then walked on stage and they're like, wait, that's not Morgan Freeman. Like, who is this guy? <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> so everyone gave, everyone was kind and not nice is what yep. you're saying. Yep. And yep. Uh, so I ended up doing it myself and it was painful and I procrastinated, but uh, yeah, five and a half hours of me uh, reading through it. So that's fun. Uh, it's also on Kindle. Um, and then, you know, uh, if anyone wants to find out more information, even beyond that, you can go to jasoncutter.com and you can also reach out to me. You can get the book directly from me as well. I love signing and sending them out and, and whatnot. Okay. Uh, and then in the past month and a half, I also published two other books. One I'm a contributing author, author on, which is called Voices for Leadership, um, which is fun. My chapter in that book is called Marry the Vision, Date the Strategy, which maybe that'll be a part two that we should do someday. Mm. Um, and then the other book, is I co-wrote it with a, a friend of mine and it's called Reasons Not to Focus on the Sales Experience, uh, which is fun because there are no reasons. So uh, once you check out that book, you'll see- It's just blank what pages. It's about. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, it's, it's, it's not all blank. There are some questions in there for you to answer. And then it's mostly a lined book to help facilitate it. And we use it, he and yeah. I, in different scenarios, we use it, we go into companies and they get a copy for everyone. And we use it as a, a workbook essentially, because the punchline is there are no reasons not to focus on the sales experience, especially, especially in this day and age in 2022, people, people will make decisions about who they buy from based on the experience because everything is a commodity. There's nothing special other than Apple. Apple owns the market on iPhones. Everybody else has competition in their direct thing, which means only the sales experience will matter moving forward um, yeah. because of the internet leveling the playing field. And so that, that, that's available on um, Amazon. And then we, you know, like I said, we do bulk stuff for, for people. So that one's really fun. Cool. Well, we'll include all that stuff in, in, uh, in the show notes. Um, but yeah, I, just, I love that you actually went ahead and took people's advice. Cause I think, I think it's, there's nothing better than actually hearing in the voice of the author, you know, as, as well. I know I, I just, uh, did Matthew McConaughey's, uh, green light. Yeah. Uh, he actually read that too. And it, 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 there, there, there's just a difference when it's, it's actually the artist or the author who you're hearing it from as opposed yeah. to somebody else, because like you said, it's more authentic, but also it's, it's your voice, right? And there's, mm -hmm. there's a certain energy about your voice and it's, it's just, 
I think it's fabulous. So I've never, I've and, never and what I will audi- say audibleized anybody, any of mine, but <laughs> yes, but here's what I'll say is for anyone who's writing a book, if you're in the process of writing a book or thinking about ever writing a book, the one piece of advice I did not follow was read your book out loud before you submit it for per print. The reason why I say I didn't do that, I read it about 12 different times and redlined it and kept finding things. Didn't read it out loud. Three months after the book came out, I sit down to start reading it. Page two, there's a typo. Page five, there's a typo. Page, like, I'm like, no, I got a thousand of these being print, like it already printed. So uh, take that, take that tip. If you're going to write a book, read it out loud, as painful <laughs> as that sounds. But it's more authentic to have the spelling yeah, it, it was a, a, a Authentic lesson about some authentic <laughs> typos that I authentically found. Yes. <laughs> I tell people that I, I put them in there just to catch people off guard. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But anyway, it's just, <laughs> it's funny how some people make a big deal out of it anyway. Yeah. Well, Jason, this was great. Thank you, uh, you know, for coming on. I had a great, great time talking to you and just love what you're doing. Um, love your story. You know, and again, it, it's one of those where, you know, the more I do these, the more I meet people literally all over the world. I am just so convinced about how much more similar we all are than we ever even realize if we'll just be open and curious yeah with other people you're going to find out i mean like i said yeah we have the the same first name right but there's a lot of other things that are very similar about our backgrounds or things that we've experienced too that we never would have known and i'm sure that we have in common with lots of other people and that everybody else has in common with other people too so yeah. it's uh, no reason to feel alone in this world because uh, there's a lot of us that are the same, especially with 7 billion people in the world. Yeah. So. And, and maybe a third of them having the first name Jason. So there is that. <laughs> that we're born <laughs> between the years of. Blah, yes. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yes. And thank you for having me on here. This has been a blast uh, as I, as I knew it would be. And, and hopefully some good stuff for people listening. Hopefully people got that nugget they were intended to get by being here. Well, I'm sure they did. And like I said, it's, it's, it's one of those where I tell people it's okay to listen to things more than one time, because every time you do, you're going to get something new out of it. Right. So every time you watch a, a movie again, every time you read a book again, every time you listen to a podcast another time, there's going to be something new that'll come out of it because you're a different person and it will resonate with you. Uh, differently at that point in the future. So, so thank you. And yeah, I, I, uh, I think we're going to have to do this again because I had a lot of fun. And would you say marry the marry the vision, date the strategy? I love that. That's that yep. would be a great one too. So, we'll do this again. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Well, thank you, my friend.